So hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar Getting Started at CSES, which is a beginner's guide to the user lab, the CSES user lab. So the webinar is meant for the CSES user community. It will, be, it will be presented by me. My name is Luca Marcella, and I work in the user engagement and support unit at CSES, and by my colleague, Sebastian Keller, who works in the same unit, and he will talk uh, a bit later about running jobs with the Sloom scheduler. So the outline of the webinar is the following. We will start describing the users, user policies that we have at CSCS in terms of, well, general policies, then in particular about data retention policies and fair usage policies. Then we will go through talking about the resources that you have in the CSCS infrastructure. That means file systems resources, computing resources. So how to access the system, how to, to prepare your submission, your job submissions. And then my colleague Sebastian will go through the section running jobs, explaining in detail how to use the Sloom scheduler in order to submit your jobs. And he will also explain some uh, good practices, best practices, what to do, what not, not to do when you use the Sloom scheduler. Finally, last but not least, we will talk about troubleshooting. So what happens if you happen to be in trouble, if you get some errors, some, if you experience some problems. We will point out the links to the documentation and the list of frequently asked questions, and we will describe how to submit a support request. So let's begin with the user policies. Let's start with the general policies at CSCS. So on the user portal and on the main CSCS website, we make reference to the policies in terms of the code of conduct, which outlines proper practices that users should have when accessing CSCS systems. So we should have, uh, as CSCS staff, access to source codes in case you ask for support. So when you actually uh, access the system, you agree to make the codes available to us when you ask our support, because otherwise, of course, we cannot uh, enter the source code and give you the, the best support that is possible. There is, in the code of contact, also mention to the scientific advisory committee, which is uh, a, a set of uh, persons listed in the CSCS page. Committee members must not be contacted at any time because they are responsible for the uh, final decisions on uh, project allocations. And then uh, acknowledgements. That's particularly important for us as uh, you must acknowledge the use of CSCS resources in all the publications that are related to your production jobs. And uh, a suggestion is to reference that in the acknowledgement session, section of your publication with we acknowledge CSCS resources of project ID, and then you put the uh, ID of your project. That's really important for CSCS to be recognized in terms of the contribution to the scientific community. Then, also user regulations are linked in the main uh, CSCS website and also on the user portal. User regulations define the basic guidelines for accessing your account. In particular, they stress that the accounts at CSCS are personal. So sharing an account and a password with somebody else is forbidden. And that's uh, uh, something that, please, you should remember, because it happened in the past that we had to remind some users about that. We also have to comply with the ATH Zurich Acceptable Use Policy for Telematics Resources. That's a long uh, PDF file with some rules that you can download from the link that I put in the slides or in the PDF slides. So please let us remind that the access to the CSCS platforms may be revoked to the users that are violating the policies that we actually find are violating the policies. So please, if you are not sure of uh, anything related to the policies, it's better that you ask us writing to us directly before uh, getting in trouble. About data retention policies. So data is uh, of uh, utmost importance today, nowadays. So we need to be 
quite clear on how we manage your data. So there is a, a data backup service for active projects at CSCS, and this concerns data stored in the users and in the project folders only. So they are, the data there is backed up, and you can ask to retrieve up to the past 90 days. So there is a copy made immediately, primary copy, and then every time you modify that, the copy primary is kept up to 90 days, and the second modifi modified copy is kept as well. And then the thing gets updated during the uh, uh, evolution of your project. Data recovery is also possible using the so-called snapshots. These are provided by the GPFS file system, so both on users and project. And they are available daily, but only for the past seven days, including the current one. So you can do that by yourself. The procedure is described on the link that I put in the data recovery keyword here and it's on the user portal. That allows you to manage yourself, your files in case by mistake you happen to delete something in the past uh, couple of days. Please be aware that data will be removed three months after the expiration of the project. So that is a strict rule, so please don't forget that. And please keep also in mind that as soon as your project expires, the data backup is disabled immediately, so there will be no data recovery possible after the final data removal three months after the expiration of the project. Then about data retention, let me also uh, describe the rules for the scratch file system. So there is no recovery in case of accidental data loss on the scratch, and there is no recovery of the data deleted due to the cleaning policy on Scratch, because there is no backup of the data in Scratch. We will see that uh, more in detail later. And last but not least, the pre usage policies. We have some shared resources at CSCS, shared among all users. And uh, to these resources that are limited, we need to apply some pre usage policy. The first one is the Sloan scheduler. The job scheduler is a shared resource because all users use the same scheduler to submit their jobs. So since it can handle a limited amount of jobs in total, you are not you have to avoid submitting large numbers of jobs and Sloan commands at the same time. So in general, people ask us how large is large. And as a rule of thumb, you can deal with a thousand jobs per day normally per user. If you go over that or if you rate if your submission rate goes above a few jobs per second, then uh, we might get in trouble if the thing increases. If all users would do that, you would experience immediately as a tremendous slowdown on the on the slow scheduler. So please keep in mind that we will be forced to kill jobs of and limit new submissions for users that are violating this fair usage policy. We might contact you, but if it is an emergency, we might need to immediately kill the jobs and limit your submissions first. Otherwise, all other users will be impacted. Another shared resource is the lo are the login nodes. So login nodes as well, they are limited in terms of uh, CPU and memory. So running applications on login nodes is not allowed because other users might not be able to log in if the uh, login node slows down. So you should, you should submit your simulations using the Sloom scheduler. So you should write a batch job script and submit it in order to run on the compute nodes. And another uh, important point is that heavy processes running on the login nodes will be terminated if they are impacting the stability of the node. So I'm talking about processes that might be able to run in the post pre and post processing queue on the system. So everything related to pre and post processing should not be run interactively on the login nodes. We monitor these activities. Our system managers uh, continuously write to us in case of uh, issues related to the uh, overloading the node. So please try to comply to these rules, otherwise we will be forced to intervene and terminate the processes. Let's switch now 
to the resources available in, at CSES in terms of infrastructure. So, first of all, once you want to access these resources, you need to access the systems. And uh, in order to do that, you should have already obtained an account at CSES. The procedure to request an account is outlined on the main CSES website and on the user portal at the link that is uh, on this page on the top. The front end system is called ELA, so it's the main gateway to all systems at CSES, and it is accessible from a standard Linux Unix terminal with the SSH command as ELA.CSES.CH. You have the command on the right side of the of the slide. You can, from Hela, since Hela provides just a minimal Linux environment, you can do a limited amount of things. In particular, you can SSH to other computing systems at CSCS from Hela. For instance, you can SSH dynt.cscs.ch to access the Pits dynt uh, computing system. Or you can also start an external data transfer with grid FTP to or from CSCS, for instance, if you want to move your files. The external data transfer service is described on the user portal at the link that is outlined in the slide. And uh, it can access uh, most of the file systems available at CSCS. So you can transfer files from starting the process from ELA, but it's not limited to the files file system that you can access from ELA. Please note the following. There are no programming environments on the front-end system ELA, so you cannot compile on ELA. And user scratch spaces of the computing systems are not accessible from ELA. So you need to log in to a computing system in order to do uh, computing. Let's describe now briefly the file system resources before going to the computing system. File systems resources apply to every system at CSES. So as you see in the table on screen, you have on top the name of the file system, how we call the file system at CSES, and then in the columns, the, the left side describes the different uh, items describing the file system. So the type of the file system, the quota, if there is any quota, expiration of the data stored in the file system, data backup if present or not, Access speed, if fast, slow, medium speed, and then the total capacity, which is the capacity available to all users. In particular, I want to uh, stress the fact that there is a soft quota implemented on Scratch on Pitsdynt in order to prevent an excessive load on the Luster file system, that is the file system type of Scratch of Pitsdynt. So. What happens if you reach this soft quota? Soft quota, as described in the table, applies to files. So when you reach one million files. To be precise, it's inodes, which include also folders, but let's say that files for a, 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 let's say files for a shortcut. When you reach one million files on the scratch in your user scratch space, then you will get a warning when you try to submit jobs, and you will not be able to submit anything anymore until you reduce the number of files. So when you go below 1 million files, then you will be able to submit again. You can check these quotas using the command quota on ELA, as described on the file system page on the user portal. So let's go in detail about a couple of file systems. Scratch file system. Scratch is meant to be a fast workspace for running your jobs, designed for performance other than, rather than reliability. And because of that, there is a cleaning policy in place. So files older than 30 days will be deleted. And the script deleting these files is running every day. So please don't target this file system as a storage file system. Also because there is no backup of the data on Scratch. So the, you, the best practice would be to transfer your data as soon as your production job completes in order to avoid losing any data. There is also a note on performance of the Pitstein Scratch, which is, as I said, based on a Luster file system. The soft quota on inodes, files and folders that I already mentioned, to avoid having large numbers of small files, because the performance decreases with the amount of files stored as a whole in the file system. So 
that's the, the soft quota is uh, meant to avoid uh, a degrade performance degradation. And also, degradation occurs with a higher occupancy. So occupancy impacts performance. If your occupancy grows over 60% overall in the scratch, we might ask you to remove immediately unnecessary data in order to prevent going to the further step, which is uh, occupancy over 80%. At this point, the occupancy is critical, and we will need to free up disk space manually ourselves, removing data without further notice if our first call to remove unnecessary data is unattended from most of the users. So that's unfortunately something that occurred rarely in the past. So we have a quite big stretch capacity now on Pits9, which is almost nine petabytes. So we hope we will not be forced to do that. But please keep in mind then that data on scratch is to be kept at your own risk. So as soon as you complete your simulation, please move data to a safer file system with a long storage uh, goal. Uh, all CSA assistants provide a scratch personal folder for each user, and there is an environment variable dollar scratch that points to that space. Another important file system, users and project. They are both shared parallel file systems based on the IBM GPFS software. So they are accessible from the login nodes with a native GPFS client. They are meant to provide storage space for data sets, shared code, or scripts for a medium term, let's say. And they provide better performance as well if you keep larger files only. So we also advise to tar small files using the Linux tar utility in order to have better access performance to the files. These are files that are not supposed to be used to run your jobs. So the emphasis on these file systems are is reliability over performance. In fact, all directories are backed up using GPFS snapshots, as I mentioned in the policy. So you can recover the daily snapshots up to the past seven days, or you can recover the backup up to 90 days uh, upon request. And there is no cleaning policy, so there is a large overhead in terms of data kept until three months after the end of your project. Then the data will be deleted. You have also environment variables that let you access the personal folders in users. The variable is called dollar home and points to users slash users slash dollar users. Dollar users is the environment variable that points to your username. Dollar project points to slash project, your group ID slash dollar user. So this is created at your login. If not, please contact us because there's a script that is supposed to do that. Let's switch now and talk about computing resources. Computing time on Cray systems is accounted in node hours and resources that have been assigned to you after a successful proposal or a, a, a contract agreement are assigned over three months windows. So that means that quotas will be reset every three months, in particular on these dates, April 1st, July 1st, October 1st, and January 1st. You should use thoroughly the quarterly compute budget within this time frame, so the three months window. And keep in mind that unused resources in the three months periods cannot be recovered, so they are lost if you don't use them in the three months window. In order to check the usage of your budget, your computing budget, in the current allocation window, so the three months period, you have a couple of possibilities. You can use the group usage common, SBU check, on the system where you intend to check your budget. And this will report also the, the, the group usage across the other systems that you have access to. So you log in on Pits9, for instance, you run SB check, and you see the breakdown of the group usage of your projects around all the system. You have also the possibility to check uh, the, the, the usage of this allocation day by day. A command that is called a script that is called monthly usage does that, monthly underscore usage. It has also the option, dash dash individual, to account the usage per group member. So you will see the breakdown usage member by uh, per user in your project. You have also the overview of resources with the new account and resources tool that is available on the CSCS uh, 
web portal, a uh, user portal, we have a dedicated page describing the use of this tool, which can be accessed with the, your login credentials using, used to access ELA, the front end. Let's go now to the resources available on, in the user lab. So at the moment we have Pitstein, which is the flagship system, which is available to the user lab, and it is a Cray hybrid system. It features both XC50 and XC40 nodes. The XC50 nodes are based, they feature a, Hin, a Intel Haswell processor and an NVIDIA Tesla GPU P100. The XC40 compute nodes features two Intel Broadwell processors. And uh, uh, the login node then, which are which have large memory because in general they use for compiling code. The interconnect configuration is based on Aries routing and it has a Dragonfly network topology. And the scratch capacity, which for Pit Dient is 8.8 .8 petabytes at the moment. Let me just stress that the variable dollar scratch, as I mentioned already, is pointing to the user space, which for Pit Dient is slash, slash stretch slash SNX 3000 slash dollar user. So this is the absolute path. Project and store file systems are mounted with read-only access on compute nodes. So we discourage in general to use project to keep executables for running. So please try to copy things on Scratch also because you cannot write a project. Now, before you want to run your jobs on Pitstein, you need to set up the programming environment once you log in on Pitstein. So CSCS systems, including Pitstein, use the modules framework in order to manage the path to libraries and applications. So please check the loaded modules with a common module list. By default, there are some modules loaded at login once you log in on the system. The default environment for programming, programming environment in Pitstein is program tray, so the tray programming environment. And the default architecture targeted by on, uh, at login is the XC50, so based on Intel Haswell processor and uh, Tesla GPU, P100. The Cray PE Haswell module file will be loaded, and you will see that in the module list output. You can browse the available modules, except uh, uh, other than the ones that you have already loaded with a common module avail. So this will give you a very long list of all the possible modules that you can load. You can use that to adjust the targets of your uh, simulations. That depends on your project. So please use again the SB check command to check which node is your project targeting. Because depending on the project, you can target either the GPU nodes or the multi-core nodes or both. That will be marked as hybrid or multi-core in the output of your SB check uh, command. So in order to adjust the target, you have two modules available. One is called Daint GPU and one and the other one Daint MC. The first one targets the XC50, which features GPUs, in fact, with the Haswell processor. The second one targets the XC40 featuring Broadwell nodes, Broadwell processors in the nodes. These modules will also update your module path. So if you load this module, you will have more modules available, which you can discover the module avail command. You can use the common module switch to swap between these two modules, which will swap also the available modules. I will now hand out the slides to my colleague Sebastian that will talk about proper practices and how to run Sloan jobs. Hello everybody, I'm Sebastian and I'm going to talk about how to uh, run jobs on CSCS systems. Uh, on CSCS machines we have uh, a scheduler called Slurm, um, you, which you can use to run jobs. Running jobs is really a two-stage process. First you uh, prepare a script and second, in the second stage you then use the command as batch to launch that script to the system. Those job scripts con consist of two parts. First, there's a 
a couple of s batch directives that describe the resource requirements of your job. And secondly, there is a list of commands uh, that describe how to run your program. To get you started with those uh, job scripts, we have prepared um, a job script uh, generator that you can access on the user portal web page. You can use simple drop down menus to uh, select the kind of resources that you need, and then it will automatically generate the job script for you. This will uh, cover the most, uh, most frequent options needed. However, if you need something uh, specific or something more detailed, you can either check the SBatch man page on the system, but you can also check the Slurm online documentation. There's one uh, Slurm directive that I want to talk about in particular, and because it's uh, specific to our system, and that's the different queues that we have on the system. The corresponding Slurm option for that is dash dash partition, and you can, it, on the job script scanner generator, you have the following options here described in a table that you can select. The different queues are there to tailor the execution of the job to your specific needs. For instance, if you want to submit a uh, a job that's just for testing or you're, or you're debugging an issue, you may use the debug queue. That one has a maximum no count of four, uh, four nodes and a maximum time of uh, 30 minutes. So, it, so that's a pretty severe limitation, but in exchange, you get a much higher priority and you will wait less until your job starts. For most production work, you're gonna be using uh, or submitting to the normal queue. And then there's a couple special queues to uh, suit more specific needs. For instance, uh, there's a large queue for uh, extremely large jobs with more than 4,400 nodes. Um, these usually uh, are used by reservation or arrangement only. Then there's a, a long queue where you can submit up to uh, up to five jobs in total for jobs that need to run for for more than 24 hours and one other queue that i like to mention is the transfer queue uh, labeled as xfer you can use that to transfer data uh, from your system to css for instance if you're running rsync or scp um, one uh, nice thing to note about that is that uh, all the time that's going into the X for a queue is not uh, credited or deducted from your compute budget so that queue is free to use. So I recommend if you have some rsync command that syncs a lot of data, so, uh, run that on the transfer queue rather than logging node. Um, once you've submitted your jobs, They'll be uh, they'll enter the pending queue on uh, one of the queues that you submitted to, and you'll of course all be interested to uh, get some information what's happening to your jobs. If you type the command sq minus u user, it'll list all the jobs that you have in your uh, that you have pending in the queue, also the ones that are running. Um, it'll give you a bunch of information, most of which should be evident from the corresponding field label in the table. One that most of you will be concerned about is uh, called ST, that refers to the status. It's usually either running or pending. If the status is pending, there, there's a reason given in the next column. More on that on the next slide. Then you can also Observe the general state of the queues if you type S info, where I added that minus O uh, list of options just to uh, uh, skip the last column called node list here in the in the sample output because there's more than 6,000 nodes in the system and that just clutters your uh, output. So if you want to clear over you omitting the last column, you can use this option that I provided. 
Um, so using sinfo, you can observe how many nodes are uh, allocated and how many nodes are idling in a specific queue. So back to job priority, we get a lot of requests uh, in the support system you, uh, asking why job XYZ is not running. And the general uh, way it works is that each job gets a priority. And you can check that priority with the command as prior as prio dash w. The job priority is based on the partition that you submit to. So for instance, debug would give you a higher priority compared to uh, normal. Then there is fair share, which reflects uh, how much uh, compute time you've used relative to your total budget. And then there's also waiting time. So the longer the job has spent waiting in the queue, the higher automatically the priority. As mentioned before, with the command sq u um, user, you can check the reason why a job is pending. And one possible reason, for instance, if it's not starting, might be that you have already exhausted your budget. You can check that with sbu check. And if the reason is priority, then you just have to wait longer. That just means that there's other jobs in the system with a higher priority and your job needs to wait until to get a sufficiently high priority. Also from time to time um, there's uh, maintenances going on in the system or large run, large runs uh, based on reservations. Um, if that's the case you can uh, find out about it by using the command s control show reservations. And also a note about how to uh, distrib distribute your compute load. As mentioned by Luca, CSCS has uh, three month allocation periods. And so if everybody just submits all the jobs at the ends of those three month uh, windows, you're never going to use your uh, full allocation. If you want to fully utilize your share, it's best to uh, linearly use up your budget over the entire Three month period. So, some uh, good practices when submitting jobs. If you accurately specify um, the runtime of your job, that's going to increase the uh, scheduling efficiency and overall throughput. So, you obviously need to uh, request enough time for your job, otherwise, it's going to be killed before completion. But on the other hand, don't uh, request too much time because that decreases the scheduling efficiency. As mentioned previously, don't uh, run jobs from your home. Uh, instead, move your data to Scratch and launch jobs from there. If you're submitting many, many tasks, say more than a thousand, we advise you to use a meta scheduler and for that, we have um, an application called Greasy. Also, here's an, uh, a note about the specific of S runs. If you have a, um, a script that contains a lot of S run directives, if they all fail, that places an extremely high load on the schedule. And that's because an S run command that fails has a much shorter turnaround time compared to an SRUN task that actually works. So if you have hundreds of SRUN tasks and they all fail, that's straining the scheduler with, a, with those hundreds of uh, uh, tasks set in a very short amount of time. If, you're, if you want to guard against that, one way could be to just pause for, say, two seconds between every job step. So here's some examples of what you should not do uh, when submitting jobs. All the following examples are actually are, are real-world user examples, so, so people have, have done that. Submitting a job script, which in turn launches other jobs, is a bad idea, because that can easily create 
or made too many jobs in a short amount of time. You should also not submit uh, a bash script that a job script that contains tens of thousands of job tasks because that's also creating too much load. In that case, also use greasy or divide it up into several separate uh, jobs. Time and time again, we see users running from home, which is not what this file system is designed for and it, for performance reasons. If you use srun and you post fix each srun command with an ampersand what's happening is it's using it's uh, running all the task steps in parallel if you do that hundreds of times it's also creating a very high load so please don't do that as also mentioned before logging nodes are shared resources so here's some example what we have uh, observed uh, what people have been knowing what we really advice not to do so if you use if you just type sq without uh, dash u you're actually using sq without any filtering and then it it's outputting all the tasks of all the users so that's a large amount of uh, output and then we we see users just use a uh, pipe and then grab users and it's much more elegant to just only generate the output that you're actually interested in even worse, actually, is using uh, the command watch, which every two second, seconds uh, executes the command supplied as an argument. And SACCT is even more expensive than SQ. So these are not commands that you should execute in a loop like this. Also, when you're compiling on a logging node, please don't just take all the cores. Um, limit to limit it to something more reasonable, so, such as eight cores, for example. Using uh, loops in general is always a bad idea uh, when slurm commands are involved. And even worse, you can have uh, loops that depend on a variable and if that variable goes wrong or doesn't evaluate to what you expect you will submit a lot of aspect, uh, slurm commands in a short amount of time so instead of just using uh, a loop to query the queue to determine you has my job started has my job started you can just use the sbatch directive mail user and then you'll automatically receive an email once your job started and you, you'll receive another email once your job ends. So to summarize how to submit jobs at SES, move your data to scratch, then accurately specify the runtime. If you just manually from time to time want to uh, observe what your jobs are doing, use SQ, but then Rather than like Bart Simpson, who's asking every second in the car, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And uh, annoys everyone by this. It's much more elegant to just let the system tell you um, when your job started or finished. Then finally, don't forget to copy the, uh, the important output data back to project or home, because otherwise you might lose it if you leave it lying around on scratch. With this, I will hand back to my colleague, Luca Marcella for troubleshooting. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. Um, so let's go to the last part of our webinar, troubleshooting. So what happens if you experience any issue in the system? So what to do in case of trouble? Then uh, I put here a quick checklist in case you experience any issue on the system. You can search the content of our user portal. So the search bar, the search field is in the top right. And looking for keywords that might match the issue that you're experiencing. Then, does your issue match any frequently asked question? We have a section in the user portal for frequently asked questions because they were asked quite often by users. So please just have a quick look also there. 
you can also browse that page in order to see if by chance what you are experiencing has already been uh, solved in the past. In case of advanced topics, advanced questions, sometimes they happen. Also, user's guide may help. So module help, man, and create publications can give sometimes a hint on the possible solution of, uh, of the, the issue. Let's go briefly to what is the basic documentation and the advanced ones. So the user portal, as I mentioned several times, user.cscs.ch gives you a basic information on the systems, how to run jobs, compilation, so many typical questions addressed by users. And the frequently asked questions uh, gather together the more the, the questions are asked more often. When you are on, on the shell, you can actually have some brief information on the modules that you have loaded with a module help command followed by the name of the module. That also sometimes gives some hints. Otherwise, you have also the man command on the shell, with, which gives you access to a manual of the command itself. For advanced topics, we have the create documentation available, which is publicly listed on the pubs.create.com website. Give, it gives you quick access and you can search, create books, white papers, any documentation available. And you can also list the main pages and third party documentation. It's available both in HTML and PDF, so that's usable to browse. It's uh, easy to browse. The CrayMind pages in particular, they are, let's say, uh, in, in the same line of the standard Linux man pages, they are the textual help files on the command line when you are logged in on the Cray system. And you can just add the man command follow, followed by the name of the man page that you're interested in. And a description, full description of the man page, as usual on Linux uh, systems, is accessible with the command man man. So what if you can find a solution? Well, in this case, you should contact us. So you, you should write an email to the uh, email address help at cscs.ch. So please specify in the subject of your request, which system are you working on and which is your project ID, which will help us speed up a bit the process. And then in the text of your message, please report the Sloan job ID and indicate what is your sl the Sloan job script in case it is an issue related to a, a Sloan job. And last but not least, if we need to have access to scripts or source files, please copy these scripts and source files to your scratch user space and give us access in terms of reading. And I will show that in the last slide with the example. Don't forget that the more detailed is your request and the more effective will be our reply. So let's see a simple example request. So this is a template message that you can adapt by changing the text in the brackets to your actual project ID, username, code name, and, and so on. The subject could be Sloan job failed on pit time in case of a job failure. And then in parentheses, I would report my project, so project, and then the project ID. And then in the content, I would just write, my username is, you will put the username here. I submitted a job with a certain job ID on pit time, and then a job running a certain code. Please put the code name or code details. Exit it with the state failed. But you can find any error in output. So you point then to the job script. Please write the script name and the input files, possibly, that you have copied on your scratch space under the subfolder job. So you write, they can be found here in slash scratch slash sonexion2000 on pit time, dollar user slash job. And then you have already given access for reading to all CSCS staff using the common chmod, so that change the mode of access. Dash capital R gives a recursive, uh, uses recursively the command. Plus R means that everybody will be able to read it. And then you put the path to the folder, like dollar scratch slash job. Dollar scratch, your user space by default is readable by everybody. So you need to give access to any intermediate step that is going through your final folder. Don't forget that, please. So with this short example, I will leave you with some useful links that have been already mentioned throughout the webinar. That means CSCS user portal, create documentation, also NVIDIA documentation, which sometimes is uh, interesting for advanced topics. 
and then the, mess the, the email address to contact us in case of troubles. And with that, I thank you for your kind attention. And uh, I leave maybe some space in case you have questions that were not addressed during the talk. So I stop sharing the screen at the moment. And uh, in case you need, you can just write in the chat if you have compelling questions. Otherwise, you can always contact us later using the channel that I have outlined. So help at cscs.ch. And I will uh, also stop the recording now.